Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. Anyone intrigued by feminist politics should make it a point to explore the writings of Professor Cynthia Enlow. Her haunting question, where are the women, runs like a thread through her work, prompting a deeper exploration of the gendered hierarchies of international relations that are often hidden on the margins. In her latest book, Professor Enlow confronts war as a gendered fixture of international politics. The persistent omission of the feminist perspectives, she argues, leads to a fundamental misunderstanding of the causes and consequences of wars. Cynthia is unwavering in her assertion that to envision just and peaceful futures, we must earnestly engage with the wartime experiences of living, breathing, and acting women. In our conversation, we revisit the roots of Cynthia's own feminist curiosity, her emphasis on the intersectionality of systems of oppression, and her perspective on militarization during both times of peace and war. When asked about her advice course of counteraction, Cynthia asserts that primarily we must act now. Later, she highlights, is a patriarchal time zone. Wartime is very silencing. It's one of the terrible things about militarism and militarization and war is that it just, as you've just so nicely said, it shrinks the space for public conversation. Not now, later. This is Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. Professor Cynthia Enlow is a research professor in the Department of Sustainability and Social Justice at Clark University. Her scholarly interests cover the intersection of feminism, international relations, the culture of militarization, war, and globalized economic forces. We spoke with her in December 2023. Thank you so much for being here, Cynthia. It's a massive honor to have you on the podcast, um, as personally as well, because Bananas, Beaches and Bases was one of my first um, texts that I read in terms of like IR or international politics. Oh, so that's wow. been honestly, yeah, it's been honestly life changing for me. Um, but yeah, just to start us off, I just have a question about your academic career and more specifically kind of where it all started, which was at the University of California, Berkeley, if I remember correctly, um, because you did your PhD there. And I just noticed that you quite often mention that UC Berkeley was kind of notorious for omitting the issue of gender and feminism, despite its very radical and revolutionary kind of reputation back in the 60s with the um, the free speech movement and various just campus-wide protests. And I was just wondering, in, you know, learning in such a in such a context, in such an environment, what inspired you to start asking the very important question, where are the women? And how did you find the, the feminist curiosity within yourself? And kind of how have you been cultivating and it's ever since up until now? Well, you know, Julia, this is a great question to ask. It's a great question for all of us, isn't it? Like, when did you start asking a question you didn't used to ask? And then what's really interesting is why did you spend so much time or why did I spend so much time not asking the question? I'm really interested in the questions we never used to ask and why it was so comfortable not to ask those questions. So I'm very interested in the lack of curiosity, including my own. And I I went, it's even more embarrassing because I went to a all women's university. It's now a co-ed university, Connecticut College, which sounds like a public university, but is a private women's university in Connecticut. And so I had gobs of women teachers. I just wrote about one of them, as a matter of fact, because, Julia, this is kind of you keep thinking back and asking new questions you never thought to ask. And I had a wonderful professor named uh, Louise Holborn who was a refugee from Nazi Germany. And I think now of what she must have thought of us. She must have thought of all these young women in her classrooms and thought we were so, I don't know, uncurious. And she was very brave. And she went back into Nazi Germany to help rescue other people. 
But I didn't know any of that. And my classmates and I didn't know any of that. And she was an older woman. Well, whatever the hell we thought older was, you know. Um, but she was probably in her late 50s when I was her student. And Louise Holborn um, had a very heavy, what Americans would call a heavy uh, German accent. She was also overweight. And we had this classroom up on the third floor. And so by the time she got to the classroom, she was and puffing. And of course, I mean, we were all stupid, of course. We we just saw the superficials. We saw an overweight weight, older woman with a heavy foreign accent. And although we all learned from her, did we take her seriously? I don't know. So I just recently published an article about her because I, it was really about my own stupidity. And I'm very interested in my own stupidity and, you know, who cultivated it and why did I, you know, stay uncurious so long? So it's even more surprising that when I went to Berkeley in the 60s, having come from a women's university that was created to take women's intellectual lives seriously, that I didn't ask feminist questions. Um, and I think there's several reasons. One, it seemed all so new. I was a Southeast Asia specialist about which I knew very, very little. I come from suburban New York. My father served in World War II in India and in Burma. So I had some consciousness, not, not very much, but some. Um, but everything else seemed so new. Also, it was a very exciting university. And once we were all involved in the free speech movement, I went out on strike like everybody else and so on. But, you know, Julia, I now try, this is one of the other things I try to look back at. I try to think about the gender politics of Berkeley, the gender politics of a place that thought itself is radical. And what were the gender politics? And one of the things I think about is I want, I now look back at myself without any feminist consciousness. There was no anti-feminism at Clark. There was no feminism. And so there was no anti-feminism. But I look back, Julia, and I think, why did I stay out of the social life of the campus radical movement? So I went on strike, I was picketing, I, you know, did all that kind of thing because I was a teaching assistant. So I had to make choices about crossing picket lines and I didn't cross picket lines. I was on the picket line. But I look back and I think, but I did make a conscious decision not to go to the parties. And I think without any feminist consciousness, why did I stay away from the social life of the movement. And I don't know if all of you have had that experience where you become involved in something you really care about and you become involved publicly, a campus issue or a larger issue. You go to the rallies, you, you know, you take part, but you have to make a decision whether you'll also make it your social life. All right. And that's a decision. It's, it's not like you really write down a declaration but it is a, you know, you're making a decision. And I think, Julia, that I had a sixth sense that I had no feminist language for. That the social life of the movement would be sexist. And I just thought, and probably sexualized. You know, as in every anti-colonial movement, every anti authoritarian movement and every anti-racist movement, every anti-war movement. What is the sexualized and or separate sexist character of the movement? And I didn't, I didn't go to the parties. Picket line, yes. Parties, not so much. And at the same time, Berkeley's faculty was overwhelmingly male. 
And I came from a women's university and I hardly noticed. There were 50 members of just the political science department. I was a political science PhD student. Out of 50, there were, count them, zero tenure track women. And because I was so conscious that I was trying to find faculty to work with, all of us, that's what you do when you're a graduate student. You try to think who could be on your committee, who's reasonable, who's supportive, who's knowledgeable, you know, all those things. That's what I was conscious of. And I had a wonderful faculty committee chaired by Chalmers Johnson, who was a wonderful Japan-China specialist. And he was very supportive of me in the early days of my career. Um, but I didn't even notice there were no women to choose among. That's what normality look, does to you. Normality makes you unconscious. It was only, and it has been later, that I thought, oh my God, what was going on at Berkeley in the 60s? Well, they were just taking seriously men. That's what was going on. There were a couple of us Sarah Schumer, and I say these names because it's really important to say Louise Holborn, Sarah Schumer. Sarah Schumer and I were the first women that the men, because remember these are all male faculty in political science, that the men chose to be head teaching assistants because the classes at Berkeley were like the intro to political science was 300 students in an auditorium. So you had a head, you had head TAs, and Sarah and I were the first women they'd ever chosen, you know, a little late. Um, uh, but, and we were in charge of 25 TAs. It was a big administrative job. We also taught. Um, so being a first, you'd think that would wake me up. But of course, what you're just encouraged to think is to be proud. I was the first whatever you're the first of. And pride makes you stupid, right? Because then you think, oh, that Sarah and I, that was a big deal. Um, but in fact, what I should have thought is, so why are we the first? There have been lots of women study PhD students, women in the graduate program. How come we're the first? But we didn't ask that. Now I ask it, but we didn't ask it then. So, it wasn't really, Julia, this is a long answer, but it, it wasn't really until I got away from Berkeley. And actually, I did my PhD in Malaysia, the country of Malaysia in Southeast Asia. I'm not really a Malaysia specialist now, but that was really, and I chose it because it was a multi-ethnic country and I was interested in ethnic politics in Southeast Asia. I still am. And um it really wasn't until my, wow, not even my second, my second teaching job, not even my first. And I was the, oh, and I was, this is the terrible thing about being a first. I was the first woman that the Miami University, which is a big public, even though it's got the name Miami in it, it's in Ohio, because that's where the Miami Native Americans come from. Should you ever wonder about why Miami, Florida is called Miami, Florida is because that swamp was turned into a city by a developer, male developer, from the state of Ohio. And he named his new swamp built city after the Native American tribes that, of course, were now decimated in his home state of Ohio. So Miami of Florida is named after Native Americans from Ohio who had by then been genocidally wiped out. Um, so my first job was at Miami of Ohio, big state university. Um, and I introduced courses on racism and on especially African-American politics, which the department never had. And I was the first woman in the department. But again, I didn't ask enough about, they were very nice guys, it, the, my colleagues, and they taught me a lot, but I didn't really ask. So how come guys, you waited till now to hire a woman? It was really only in my second job 
which was where I still am at Clark University outside of Boston, that I and students, really a lot has to do with students and friends I began to have in London and here in Boston began to be much more feminist than I was. And I was really interested. And they got me asking feminist questions. So it was students and friends who were smarter than I was that really nudged me along. And once I started offering, the first feminist course I ever offered was called The Comparative Politics of Women, which was looking at women, the and especially history of women's politics um, in Russia, China, Japan, the UK, Mexico. Um, and I love teaching that course. And students got very excited and then I got even more excited. And then I, only after I started teaching feminist political analysis did I start writing about it. So teaching for me is really crucial to intellectual growth and offering courses that you feel you're not really prepared to offer, but you are honest with the students and say, listen, I'm a learner, you're a learner, let's all explore this together and see what we find, um, really gave me a kind of courage to be curious and to acknowledge how little I knew, which I thought was really important for building a, an honest relationship with students. Can I, can I just ask? What yes, was that, of course. What was that, um, that sort of reflective period like? You know, you mentioned that there came a time where other people around you started asking questions that yeah. were feminist questions. And then there must have been a period where you sort of look back at your early academic career or life and think, wow, like I was the first woman to do this and there weren't that many women at Berkeley. What was that period like where you're reflecting on those realities and how much does it, how much did it inform your work as well? Because it seems like extremely personal, which I think it is, is very personal, Ollie. I think it's a great question. And, and it, the, I think the, First time, I remember I was on a committee. This was at Clark, and it was a committee to choose the new president. You know, they have these search committees, right? And I think the guys who suggested, I was a young faculty member, and I think the guys who select, let's let's put Cynthia on this search committee. Honestly, Ollie, I thought they I think they thought I was a pushover that would do what they wanted. Well, not so much, you know, but they were a little disappointed. But but the thing is, on the committee was were two representatives from the graduate student body. And oh, I should be able to remember. Gail, another name. Gail Hornstein. And she was a graduate student in psychology. And I remember one night we had a these meetings went on forever with, you know, dried sandwiches and you know what those meetings are like. And, and we had a bit of a break in the long meeting and Gail got me aside and she said, Cynthia, I'm only a graduate student. I can't ask this question. You're a faculty member. I was a young faculty member, but she, you know, for her, I was a faculty member. And she said, you have to ask why are there no women on the short list? And I thought, because you know what I thought, Ali? I thought that will out me as the woman in the room. And I, of course, I was passing, if you will, you know, like everybody does. If you're the first of something in the room, you by your body language, the questions you don't ask and so on, you kind of just hope that nobody will notice <laughs> I mean, it's terrible, right? The pressures. And, but Gail said, no, you have to ask. And so I keep reflecting on those moments, but sometimes, I mean, right then and there, I knew I had to ask myself, why was I reluctant to do what Gail asked me to do? I did do it, but I felt nervous because I thought, oh, my faculty colleagues on the search committee will notice now that I'm a woman. It's like they knew, knew, but it will be that like I'm in the room as a woman. 
And I thought, I maybe that will undermine my credibility, right? So I think right then and there, I did reflect. So sometimes my reflections or my reflectiveness has come when I'm embarrassed. And, and then I, you know, when you're embarrassed, it makes you kind of curious about why you're embarrassed, right? Sometimes my reflectiveness, like wondering about why we were so arrogant as young students towards Louise Holborn, that came much later. So some reflectiveness comes at the moment, especially when you're embarrassed and you kind of in your own mind to start to think about, why am I so embarrassed about this? Other times, reflectiveness is long, long afterwards. And there are things I'm asking now that I didn't. I, For instance, I wasn't reflective at the time about the sexual and sexist politics of the free speech movement. I just kind of limited. And it was only later, especially since the free speech movement of the 1960s at Berkeley became heralded. And so there were a lot of new, you know, memoirs and documentary films about the great heroes, you know, give me a break. Anyway, but, you know, about these people. And, and as those came out, I thought, well, they're not really telling the full story here. And then I become reflective. So I don't think you ever stop. I think it's really interesting. It's not like your own reflections are the most interesting thing in the world. I mean, they're not, you know. Um, but they are interesting for your own intellectual honesty. And even if you don't talk about them or write about them, they're good to fess up to, I think. And they're probably always very specific to you something about your own situation or your own aspirations or your own personality or your own group of friends and colleagues that will be very specific. But there, it's interesting, at least to yourself and maybe to a good friend, to kind of think it through. And they might be more widely shared than you imagine. Because when you're embarrassed, you think you're the only one in the room who's embarrassed. Right? It's like going to a party and walking into a party and you're sure you're the only one in the room who doesn't know anyone else at the party. I was just at a big party where somebody who said, oh, everybody else here knows somebody. I mean, it was hundreds of people. And I said, oh no, if you look around the room, I can see people are just talking to the people they already knew when they came. They don't know everybody in the room and they're not like social, you know, socially skilled. No, no, they're just over there in the corner talking to the friend that they came with. So I, I think oftentimes you find your own kind of embarrassing reflections or your reflections on your own embarrassment are more widely shared. And that becomes really interesting. I think. Um, so sorry, could I just come in? Yeah, could sure. I come in there. Oh yeah, sure. Um, Hannah. I'm Hannah, one of the co-hosts and researchers for the podcast. And I find so. it really interesting what you've been saying about kind of knowing when to say something and finding that moment, because this is also something that I thought was really interesting in your book that you just published um a while ago, not too not too long ago, about the 12 feminist uh, lessons of war, where you say that basically in war that it is often portrayed like this is not the right time for women to kind of promote their own rights um, and always with this key word just being later and having this discussion afterwards but then often it is already too late and you're going back to this patriarchal structure so I was just wondering um, how do you think that you can recognize this right moment and also find a way to kind of convince other members of society to see that it and understand that it is I'm thinking about this a lot right now because of the wars with Gaza and Israel and the wars in Ukraine and the wars in Sudan. I mean, there are a lot of horrible armed conflicts going on now. I try not to ever just headline one of them. In fact, I'm reading, I'm in conversation with a Sudanese feminist now and things I just didn't know at all. But it is true, I think, Hannah, that and this is one of the things that 
led me to write the 12 Feminist Lessons book, um, which is, for me, exploratory as well as pulling other feminist lessons so they're more public. But, and that is that wartime is very silencing. It's one of the terrible things about militarism and militarization and war is that it just, as you've just so nicely said, it shrinks the space for public conversation. Not now, later. You know. And not now, later is to anybody who's concerned about social injustice in the midst of the war. Not now, later. And feminists are told that all the time. I was just talking to Ukrainian feminists who are, of course, under enormous pressure because of Putin's aggression. They're under enormous pressure from other Ukrainians not to talk about domestic violence, not to talk about, which is common in virtually every military, of male soldiers' sexual abuse of female soldiers. It's true about um, any military you know and don't love or know and maybe you admire, just ask. Just see what is happening inside the military. Anyway, so both about domestic violence, but also about sexual abuse inside the military. Ukrainian feminists are told, Hannah, we're under such pressures now from the Putin aggression. You cannot ask those questions now. Later. And as I kind of came up with my bumper sticker <laughs> um, in the book and say, later is a patriarchal time zone. Later is a patriarchal time zone, which means because it serves all kinds of injustice supporters, racists, sexists, classist injustice promoters want you to wait till later because they know later they'll be stronger than ever. And Ukrainian feminists say that they're under enormous pressure to stay silent now about injustices that are, of course, as in every country, are part and parcel of Ukrainian society. Um, what I don't know is what kind of pressures Gazan feminists are under. Because before this terrible assault by the Netanyahu government, by the way, I don't talk about Israel and I don't talk about Gaza. I talk about the Netanyahu government and I talk about the Hamas government and I talk about the Palestinian Authority. I want to, I talk, try to talk about people who have the authority to make decisions. I try not to talk in, it's really important in this time in our lives. It's important all the time. It was important during World War I, not to talk about whole categories of societies. I really, more than ever, try to talk and use the language of who I think, I mean, I'm never an expert, but who I think are the main decision makers. And then I try to talk about them. And it has been very hard for Israeli feminists to speak out. Most of them are pro-Palestinian rights as well as pro-social um, justice uh, for women inside of Israel. They're both. Um, but Ukrainian feminists, Gazan feminists, it is very hard to speak out about the injustice in your own society when there's a war on. So you're really good to notice that in the 12 feminist lessons, because it is one of the things that kind of run, that kind of runs through all the chapters, doesn't it? Right? How hard it, it is hard to be a feminist. And it becomes even harder if your society is collectively under attack. But it's also hard for Russian feminists. Russian feminists are in jail now. Because while the Putin regime, and it is a regime, not just a government, I use that term also very carefully. Um, the Putin regime sees Russian feminists as undermining his 
imperial war effort. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I find that really interesting, like how you speak about that and also how you say that how much stamina and kind of endurance it takes to be a feminist nowadays. So I was just wondering, like, how how do you deal with that in your daily life, kind of knowing about all of these like terrible fates that some people have to deal with, hearing all of these stories um, and seeing how much inequality and injustice there still is and still seeing also having like hope and like keeping working towards a better future, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I think stamina is really underrated, isn't it? You know, and it's hard to study, but it's worth studying with anyone who's doing social justice work around anti-racism, anti-colonialism, anti-patriarchy. Um, try to get a handle when you talk to people about just the question you've asked, Hannah. How do you keep going? And I think oftentimes, because the people who want you to be quiet will accuse you of being either crazy or treasonous or both, you know, an insane tr traitor, <laughs> you know, why accuse you of both? They'll accuse you of one, they'll accuse you of both. Um, and I think there's several things that I've learned from Ukrainian and Palestinian and Israeli um, Sudanese feminists and, and Chinese feminists, by the way, who are under enormous pressure. Um, and that is be sure to have at least a couple of other friends who share your views, because the first thing that does is it says, oh, I'm not crazy. Look, these other people who I admire, they're having a hard time speaking out but they see it the way I see it. They're interested in what I'm interested in. I'm not crazy. And the second thing is, I'm not alone. Because, you know, Hannah Arendt, who was not a feminist, um, that's also very interesting as to why she wasn't, but I'm a big admirer. Oh, so in my very messy study, I do have some order. Not a lot, mind you. Not a lot, but I have some. And... This is all, 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 all Hannah Arendt. All Hannah Arendt. Um, so, and one of the great insights she had in Origins of Totalitarianism, and if you've never, I was going to say tackled, because it looks big and, you know, read slowly, make it, you know, a year project. Um. And one of the things that really stuck with me from her writings, I was also lucky because I actually heard her speak twice. So that had a huge impact. Um, uh, was, she said, Hannah, totalitarian aspirants, Putin, they are determined to make every person think they're alone. And if any of us who think we're in the minority in how we're making sense of things can at least find a small group, maybe two more people, maybe eight, but you know, where you voice your concerns, your worries, and your understandings, questions you would like to ask, but you're afraid to ask in public under these oppressive conditions, you will not be alone. And if you're not alone, the authoritarians can't get you. Because you've kept not just your soul, you've kept your mind, your active, curious mind. And it may be too dangerous to ask the questions that the Chinese feminists are now asking about sexual harassment. It may be too dangerous to ask the questions, although they keep asking them. Chinese feminists are very brave. But at least amongst yourself, you can say, haven't you wondered what's happening? And then ask your feminist question. And the other person says to you, 
you know, I've been wondering the same thing. How would we go about doing it? And just when that person says, I've been wondering the same thing, you're not alone. And if you're not alone, the authoritarians haven't won. That's the great Hannah Arendt. Well, she has many insights that all of us need to learn, but it's one of the ones that has stuck with me. I mean, you offer an incredibly powerful and important uh, lens onto the current situation with Ukraine, with Gaza, perennial issues around conflict and war from a a feminist standpoint. But this is not necessarily the conventional conversation that's happening within the seminar rooms, uh, the departments of international relations. And I wanted to perhaps circle a little bit back into your experience within the academy as you were coming up through the 1970s, as you were, as you were s- sensibilizing yourself to, to the feminist curiosity, I was curious to ask, when did you encounter international relations? And when we think of IR in that era, we think of Morgenthau, we think of E.H. Carr, we think of Kenneth Waltz, uh, you know, these sort of titans, very masculine canon of IR scholarship. And um, so I'd be curious to know how you first encountered IR. And I'd also just like to push you a little bit. You said that um, non-feminists, I'm afraid, remain a bit naive about power. (laughs) And I was wondering perhaps if you might also elaborate on that in this context. Yeah, this is all kind of... um, It is interesting to think about. I think one of the things, and don't be discouraged about this, but just widen your lens. I think one of my lucky breaks, Tom, is that I started this thing called a career. Uh, Careers are very dangerous, you know, because you get on the treadmill and then, but anyway, I started this thing called an academic life um, as a comparative politics person. I was a Southeast Asia specialist and I taught Southeast Asian politics. Actually, I taught everything. I taught American politics, Southeast Asian politics, the politics of the American South, the politics of African Americans. You know, I tried to teach everything. This is all before I started teaching gender and uh, politics. Um, But I think, Tom, that that actually helped me a lot, that because I started out as a comparative politics person, I knew I had to understand the gritty in the weeds politics of countries like Malaysia. Why did elite men send their kids to English language, local English language post-colonial schools when they were advocating for Malay language primacy in the school system. That is, they were contradicting their own. And that is really interesting to me. And I think, so I think I came to this thing called IR, the capital I, capital R, which is really different than international politics, small I, small P, right? Um, Already convinced that I had to go down in the weeds, that I had to understand history, but most importantly, that I never talked about states as if they were monolithic actors, ever. I was always interested in local political party systems. I mean, you have to be if you're a comparative politics person. And I was always interested in the social dynamics that shaped or pressured or transformed these actors called states. I rarely, that's why I say I talk about the Netanyahu coalition government. I talk about the Palestinian Authority. I don't talk about the West Bank. Um, Because being a comparative politics person has warned me against treating states as monolithic actors. And those people that became... Well, became in the eyes of the rest of us titans, which, you know, um, really slid into states as actors. 
and as a comparative politics person. So if you are an international studies or international politics person yourself, don't think you all of a sudden have to transform your field into comparative politics, but always, always be wary of treating states as monolithic actors. And that will make you more curious about, well, who's who claims to speak for the state? So, oh, so did you see the great, okay, we're on film, Tom? Oh, good. I get to do yes. visuals. Okay, here we go. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. You can get this online and zoom in so you can really tell. Okay. This is one of the great photos of the last news cycle. Okay. How much can you see most of the photo? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Go on. Try and count the women. I came up with nine. Yeah. This is at the cops. This is no, the that's picture. Not, that's of not 40 years heads ago. Heads of state and heads of government. So King Charles is there as a head of state, right? But this is head of state and head of governments. One of the biggest kind of group photos of the world's power holders in recent history. Nine, count them, nine women. And what, 150 men? Well, of course, no feminist would talk about cops as, you know, Brazil doing this and UAE doing that. They'd say, UAE? I know who the UAE is right here. It's the head of the oil ministry. That's the UAE representative here. Right? Um, and so that, I guess, is my first, well, I've had to learn it, but that was my first lucky break. I came into the study of international politics by being curious about, interested in, had investigated national politics. So I'd never treated states as monolithic actors. I use regime as versus government. I mean, I lots of things that depend on knowing what's going on in, in a particular place. The second thing is that because I started out in this thing called a career as an ethnic and racial politics specialist, because I started out well, two things. I started out as an American during the American Civil Rights Movement. So no matter what I was looking at in Indonesia or the Philippines or Malaysia, I had the U.S. racialized politics in my head. And that's true for any of us. You have your own, whatever, whatever country you grew up in, and you kind of know in that nuanced way, even if you don't call yourself a specialist in it, you bring that to whatever else you're studying. And that meant that when I came to international relations, um, I always asked the ethnic and racial question. And then I started asking the gendered racial and ethnic politics question. If I look at the Tamil Tigers and try to understand the Sri Lankan civil war. Long, long, what, 25 years? I never treat the LTTE, the Tamil Tiger, I never treat them as a monolithic group. Which boys were forced to join? Which young men voluntarily joined? Which young girls joined? Why? What happened to them? in the LTTE, what's happened to them since. Mm. So it's what feminists now call intersectional analysis. It's not you do ethnic or gender, ethnic or gender politics, or ethnic and racial or gender politics. To be realistic, you do both at the same time. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, comments that Professor Paul Gilroy uh, a, a, a black sociologist who works at UCL has also made that uh, studying race politics is really a lens to understanding solidarity across these different intersections, whether it's gender or the lack of solidarity, or the how lack. hard, 
I mean, Paul and I know each other a bit and, mm. and I'm an admirer of, of his. Um, he came to Clark, my university. I invited him to come and speak. And we went out to lunch and we talked basketball. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, over tuna melts, we talked about basketball. Anyway, um, Paul's a wonderful analyst. And, yes, he does that. And his partner is Bron Ware. It matters. And Vron Ware, who a lot of you know, um, does wonderful intersectional politics, intersectional analysis of British um, militarism. So they have conversations and that shapes both of them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I think I'm going to jump in here. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm very Tom, jealous hey, you've hey, met hey, Paul. Other Tom. I'm very jealous you've met Paul Gilroy because I wrote my master's thesis on his planetary Me humanism, too. which I find fascinating. Um, and he won't reply to my emails, but that, that, that's okay. Um, no, find out. Dima, does he have office hours? It's. I mean, this old it's, it's okay, book called you know, Office Hours? I, 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 I think maybe, but I'm not at the university anymore. But I mean, this will be cut from the podcast, but it's fine. I was just going to just drop no, that. No, say, put in your subject line, <laughs> say something about basketball. Okay, I'll and do that. You'll get a reply. That would and be say cool. hi to Paul from me. I'll do that. Um, and so I was going to ask. I mean, you you held up a newspaper, and I wanted to ask you about another recent event that that was made the headlines, um, which is the the passing of Henry Kissinger, who I think is an interesting figure, um, dominated um, U.S. foreign policy for for decades, and his legacy, you know, lives long in 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 Southeast Asia, um, of course, and I guess. I wanted to ask you your reflections on him and, and perhaps his um, role as being emblematic of a very masculine um, kind of, of international relations or perspective on international affairs um, that really seemingly relied upon the erasure of the experiences of, of particularly women. If we look specifically at the um, blood telegram um, from, from uh, East, East Pakistan, um, but also in other countries as well. So, yeah, what's your kind of, how do you view Kissinger and how do you view his his legacy in, in, in U.S. foreign policy? Well, you know how we now have feminist analyses of Aristotle or feminist analyses of um, other prominent international figures. I want a feminist analysis of Henry Kissinger, a full, maybe, maybe it will have to be a joint effort with, you know, a collection of people. Um, uh, because I think you're right. I think he wasn't, he was held up as a kind of, and this is part of that IR history. He was held up as, even if you disagreed with him, he was quote, brilliant. And brilliant in a kind of masculinist, which is more ideological, a masculinist kind of way of what does it mean to be serious? What does it mean to be brilliant? What does it mean to be tough? What does it mean to be realistic, especially with the capital R? And he got away with that, that performance. Because so many of us, you have to think of all of us now. I mean, I'm, I always try to, you know, make sure that I understand my own complicity. Um, he got away with convincing so many of us of that because we ourselves had such a shrunken notion of seriousness. And that our shrunken narrow notion of what counts as realistic. So for instance, in many ways, he was totally unrealistic because he could not and would not think about the consequences of carpet bombing of Cambodian civilian villages. He could not and would not. He counted that as capital R, R realistic because his notion of realism is 
you do not have to think about, and you should not have to think about, people who don't have power, i.e. Cambodian villagers. So in many ways, he was very weak in his intellectual capacity because he could not think about realities. But many of us, those who admired him at the time, or at least accepted the presumption that he was, quote, brilliant and tough, um, now realize that actually he was so limited. But because he presented himself in this patriarchal way, his racism is more interesting because he was so enamored with powerful men that if you were a powerful man running the Chinese government, that'd be Dao Jinping, right? Um, if you were um, a powerful man running the Chinese government, he would take you seriously. The fact that you and he, at least in some stereotypical notion, are different races of men, was you were both powerful men heading powerful states, and therefore he'd take you seriously. Um, so his racism was really somewhat what well, was on show when he didn't care about Cambodian villagers, but it also was complicated by the fact that he admired other powerful men, even if they seemed to have different racial heritages. So I think it's exactly the moment, Tom, when, and this is why obituaries are, he lived a long time, a lot of friends of mine, honestly, a lot of friends of mine raised a toast when the front page news came out that Kissinger was no longer with us. I was in a big group meeting, not big, but, you know, 15 feminists, and we all raised on cups of coffee, saying, thank God. But, but we all have to think about why for so long he had such influence. And not just with Nixon with a lot of people. And I'll tell you, when I was, my first job after undergraduate was at a publishing company. I mean, I was a gopher. I mean, I was way, you know, I was a nobody. But, um, and I would go, this is just full of confessions now. I, at lunch, so I was in New York City and I would go for lunch on my own. It was my time to kind of, Mull. I'd go for lunch to the New York Times cafeteria because the New York Times building had its own cafeteria. This was before it built its big fancy. It was just a really ordinary cafeteria, but it was kind of fun to be in the New York Times cafeteria. I'd have, I'd remember, Tom, I would have egg salad sandwiches and coffee. And you know what I took with me? This is, okay. This is, I'm just out of undergraduate. I have no idea yet that I'm going to even go to graduate school. I'm working for a publishing company, but I'm not an editor, I want you to know. I'm down on my hands and knees looking at college catalogs so they can decide where they can sell their textbooks. Um, I took Henry Kissinger's, I can picture it. I took this beaten up paperback book that he wrote when he was at Harvard before he became, he was already gaining influence as a, international politics scholar. And I took with me to eat over at the New York Times cafeteria with my egg salad sandwich. I took over his book about nuclear deterrence because I wanted to, this is the confession part, I wanted to take myself seriously. So I took myself seriously by reading, it was big, reading this paperback 
about a serious by a serious international politics thinker at the time. And I underlined it and and out of that, those lunch times, I began thinking, you know, I need to be back in school where I can do this not just at lunchtime, but I can make this my life. Once I got to Berkeley, well, I didn't read any more Kissinger because I was so immersed in British colonial history and Malaysian cultural history. And that's what I was trying to, to read. But yeah, let's have, you know what? You all could do it. Maybe do it as a kind of cloud source thing of even if everyone just wrote two pages each about what to think about Henry Kissinger now. Be a really interesting collaboration. It doesn't mean you have to all be Kissinger um, specialists. I think that we definitely have the the introduction. It's it's him, him, you reading his book inspired you to go to Berkeley and then and then founded Feminist IR as a as a thing. It, really, that that should be on his obituary, you know. Oh dear, um, poor guy, <laughs> turning over in his grave. Indeed, um, and I guess my my one reflection would be: I mean, do you do you see a change in in the legacy um, of, of Kissinger in U.S. foreign policy now? Because it does seem to still rely on. Racism, sexism, ProPublica has some fascinating articles about sexual assault in the US military that is consistently covered up. We see the way that, that non-combatants are treated, particularly if they're um, young men in, in war zones. It feels as though US foreign policy continues along this continuation of, we're going to ignore everyone that's not a big power actor and, and, and not really care about what we do to them. Well, that's very interesting, Tom. I think, I mean, Kissinger himself is the product of the presumptions about who is serious and what is realistic. So he himself gained influence because those ideas, those very narrow shrunken ideas were so prevalent in so many countries around the world, not just the US. Um, and I think they haven't died with Kissinger, but I, what I do think is different is we do have feminist IR now that we didn't have that when he was had his influence we do have many more social movements that are as tom said in solidarity that means having to think about um social justice movements in other countries and how they affect us we we are not the same people and american politics are affected by those social movements. Um, and so I think, in fact, we do have in the Biden State Department, which was started by Hillary Clinton when she was Obama's Secretary of State, we do now have an office of global women's rights. That's in the State Department. And one of the things Hillary Clinton, and I'm actually quite an admirer of Hillary Clinton, doesn't mean I agree with everything, but I'm she did a lot of things for uh to and what she because she's very smart and she's very smart about institutions what she knew was she couldn't just speak at the big, big beijing women's meeting and say women's rights are human rights which she wasn't the first person to say it but she echoed other feminists but what she knew is you better institutionalize it because you hillary will come and go but if you open an office that has a budget inside the State Department, you're much more likely to keep that focus. And there is, Trump did away with the office, surprise, surprise, but Biden reinstituted the Office of Global Women's Rights inside the State Department. Well, that's something that Kissinger would never have tolerated. Um, so I don't think it's just more of the same, more of the same. And the fact, you know, Tom, the fact, if you read the obituaries in the New York Times, for instance, now this is the formal obituary, not just a 
um, critical op-ed, the formal obituary. I think the word war criminal is used five different times. So he, his obituary, which are usually, I mean, there depends what newspaper you read, but they're, um, they try to be full, you know, I mean, we're talking about serious obituary here. Um, and I was struck by that, Tom, that war criminal was used repeatedly in the formal New York Times obituary of Henry Kissinger. Well, that's the good news. Now, of course, the U.S. government, because the Senate won't pass it, um, won't pass the Rome Statute, which is a treaty establishing the International Crimes Court, um, because the Senate won't pass the Rome Treaty, the Rome Statute, the United States state is not a part of the ICC, part of the International Crimes Court. But still, there is a discussion about war crimes in the U.S. in a way that there wasn't when Kissinger had power. So yes, the that dominant notion of masculinized, oftentimes it's referred to, have you noticed this, Tom, that oftentimes the term muscular is used? Have you noticed that the, the term muscular is very, you know, interesting in English? Anyway, it still exists. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot that has changed because of social movements, particularly the anti-racist social movements and the anti-patriarchy or anti-sexism social movements. And that helps. That does help. On the back Blinken, of that, I'm sorry, Blinken, who is the current Secretary of State, does not operate the same way Kissinger did. So I'm not sanguine about what's changed, but I always want, because I don't ever want to underestimate all of our collective social justice efforts. And sometimes the capital R realists um, amongst us, including our friends, say nothing has changed. It's just the same. But I don't think it is. I think we've had, we collectively have had more impact than people want to admit. Can I just ask you a question, Cynthia? Oh, absolutely, Zoe. Hi. That was it's really fascinating to hear you speak on on all these matters. And I guess my follow-on question from what you've just said specifically, um, is like what gives you hope that we move away from later? What what is it? I know you said that you hinted a, a bit at it with the social justice collective efforts, but I wonder if you could expand a little bit on what what gives you hope that we move away from these patriarchal structures, that we move out of the later time zone. Um what is it that yeah gives you hope? That the group of what are there seven of us here in this conversation that we use the term patriarchy. I mean, just imagine twenty years ago if we were having an IR collective discussion among seven of us. How many times would the word patriarchy come up? So what gives me hope? To be hopeful is not to be sanguine. To be hopeful is, for me, is to be determined. And I'm, I gain hope from the determination of so many social justice actors in so many different countries. I mean, my guess is that not many of the seven of us have been following Sudanese feminists. But I've been reading Reem Abbas, A-B-B-A-S, Reem, R-E-E-M, Reem Abbas, Sudanese feminist. Of course, I write all over things, so, you know. Um, but um, that we're being made smarter constantly, that gives me hope. I'm not as dumb as I used to be. I'm not smart enough, but I'm not as dumb as I used to be. That's the good news. 
So it is always, and I think when we use it, the term hope, hope is not being naive. Hope is being determined. And there are a lot of us now. I work with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, what's referred to as WILP. It has 64 chapters in 64 countries. Isn't that amazing? 64 countries have an international feminist peace activist branch. Again, it's not all good news out there, but it's it's good enough news to be talked about. And I think the people who are against achieving social justice in international politics and in national and local politics, the people who are comfortable with patriarchy, including some women who are very comfortable with patriarchy, it benefits them. Um, but people who are comfortable with racialized hierarchies. Those people benefit if we become depressed. They're hoping that we will see the world as so bleak that we won't pressure for environmental responsibility, that we won't think it's worthwhile to raise women's rights in the midst of war, that racial injustice will be swept under the rug because we've shrugged our shoulders and said, it's no point. They win. They win if we become less determined and give up hope. Well, we don't want whoever them are, capital T, we're not going to let them win. Right? Right. Can I can I jump in with something? I think it's really yeah, interesting yeah, sure, hearing you speak about your like experiences interacting with feminists from all over the world, from Sudan and talking to people in Ukraine as well, but also going back to um, earlier when you were mentioning the work that you did in Southeast Asia, I was just sort of wondering what your experiences have been um like interacting with feminists from other parts of the world but also with people who maybe are uh coming up against different oppressive apparatuses you know like forms of capitalism or, or like modern day empires things like this like what have your experiences been interacting with people who deal with these different forms of oppression well amongst my main tutors and this is one of the reasons why i wrote the 12 feminist lessons of war because i wanted to give tribute to the people who've taught me right and amongst my main tutors ollie have been filipina feminists my god they're amongst the smartest people on the planet honestly they know more about how the international political system works than just about any single group of people, Filipina feminists. And Ollie, what they taught me, because of course I was, I was also teaching Philippines politics, but I was being taught by Filipina feminists. And the feminists who taught me were working simultaneously on the rights, well, on creating the rights, the better working conditions for mainly women, about, you know, if you take all garment factories in the world, think of Levi Jeans or Gap T-shirts or Marks and Spencers, whatever. From the figures I've seen, about 70% of all garment worker, factory workers in the world are women and 30% are men, and they do different jobs in the factories. Men usually are pressers and they operate the zipper machine. All right. Um, uh, so these Filipinas said, well, you have to think about women in the Philippines, globalized Levi factories. 
here in the Philippines. At the same time as you think of then Marcos's militarized authoritarian regime. You can't, they said, Cynthia, you can't just think, oh, I'm interested in garment factories, but I actually don't want to think about the Philippines police constabulary, which is a very militarized arm of the state. Said, no, no, you have to think about both simultaneously. And that was really good, Ollie. It it made me, because I was becoming very curious, I am very curious about garment factories and, and especially sneaker factories. I'm very interested in sneaker factories. And um, they said, you've got to be interested in Marcos's weaponization of the police constabulary at the same time as you think about the sexual division of labor, gender division of labor inside of Levi's garment factory outside Manila. And that was, Ollie, that was really important for me to, to think I couldn't just have kind of siloed interests like political economy and militarism. They said, no, no, you've got to think about how one shapes the other. And I, the, and I really give a special credit to Philippines feminists for pushing me on that because it'd be very easy to be, it's so complicated to think about globalized factories, right? Um, it'd be very interesting for, it'd be very easy for me just to try to understand, which I don't fully, globalized capitalist garment factories and the lives of women and men who work in them and kind of keep it separate from my interest, which really was interest in um, the Philippines military and the Philippines police constabulary. But they said, no, no, you have to think about both. People always want you to think more complicated thoughts when you think, oh my God, I can hardly think about the things I am thinking about. And now you want me to take on even more? And they say, well, yeah. Sorry, Cynthia. Thank you so much for this. I'm I'm really sorry to uh, cut you off as well, but unfortunately, no. we're coming to a close. <laughs> Although well, we I could, could, talk I forever, could, you know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I could easily spend another four hours listening to your talk. Every time I go to a talk where you're a speaker, it's always just so captivating. And thank oh. you so much for all of your insights today. It's been incredibly fascinating to have you on the podcast. Um, and I just wanted to ask one last question before before we go. Um, I was just wondering if you have any words of advice. We, it's kind of coming back to the issue of hope and, you know, moving moving towards the future and kind of fighting with the later time zone. But just like if you have any words of advice for young people and, and students who, like all of us here um, gathered at this podcast, who just aspire to kind of engage with the feminist curiosity and gender consciousness um, in our daily lives and in our study of global affairs. Um yeah, and you know, it, it, we often, I think, recognize and we're often aware of those structures and we notice them, but there's always just this gap between noticing something, recognizing something, and then actually taking action. And I was just wondering if you have any you know, tips and tricks on, on how to actually do it. Well, one thing that, I, now this is me being greedy because I want you to do it so that you can teach me. One of the things that's been really interesting is to watch when students and it's usually it's students who do it and don't count on faculty um do gender intersectional gender audits of your programs so for instance s- students at soas gosh it was probably 10 years ago and students at the fletcher school of law and diplomacy as part of tufts here in massachusetts they're the only ones i know who've actually you start start Well, it's not easy, but start simple and just do a intersectional gender audit of every syllabus, right? And try to make visible. This is a little bit about the politics of shaming, but, you know, it has its place. At least, you know, encourage a little embarrassment. Out of embarrassment sometimes comes change. Um, About, well, who who are on the required reading list? 
who are taken seriously in classes? Who? Which authors? Which researchers? Which NGO reports? I'm a big fan of NGO reports being used in teaching. Um, and show what it looks like at UCL now as a way of saying, you know, we say we're talking about the world, but here's what the world as presented in courses looks like. Is that really the world we claim to be learning about? The other thing is then go deeper. That's just the, that's the simple starter about audits. This is called doing gender, intersectional gender audits of programs. Then start looking at invited speakers, featured and required courses. Then go the next step and look what courses, and if you have streams, oftentimes there are streams in, you know, um, you know, do you do development? Do you do conflict, you know, trade, whatever. And look at what do male students choose and what do female students use choose. And words, do, you have to dream it up yourself, but do gender audits of your programs. And this is true for listeners who are listening. Get a group of you. It takes only about five or six to start with. Students. Um, undergraduates and graduates. And do do social audits of your programs. Because if you can do a social audit of programs that you really know well, you know the nuances, you know, you can then do gender intersectional audits of the organizations you're going to work for. Because if you're going to work for Doctors Without Borders, or you're going to work for CARE, or you're going to work for the UN Peacekeeping Office, and a lot of that's where a lot of you, thank goodness, are going to go. You better know how to do it of the organization you're about to work for. By the way, we have no feminist analysis of any big international NGO or organization. If you're looking for a thesis topic. So that would be, and you know what? It boosts your spirits doing it. And making it public and having people be embarrassed. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. I'll definitely spread the word in terms of possible master's dissertation projects. That sounds like a really good one. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Oh, I'm thank you so much for joining I mean, us. I always propose things I want to read. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll make sure that you're on the, uh, the, the the committee for that one. No, 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 not on the committee. I just <laughs> want to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty well. Look, thank you so much for your time. As Julia said, I think we could have continued for hours. It was it was fascinating. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get you on again. Yes. Well, keep doing the good work. Stay determined. Don't get depressed. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.